research. I'd like to bring attention to a few of the announcements in your bulletin, but be sure to look at them and uh, note them on your calendar. So I've got a few things coming up in the next few weeks. Please pick up your stewardship letters out in the lounge. Uh, we want to thank Susan for filling in for uh, Carolyn, who's taking some time, only f not only for vacation, but to take care of Bob, who's recovering from surgery. Be sure you've signed up for your church directory picture. There's someone out in the lounge today to sign you up if you haven't done that. This weekend is the United Women of Faith basement sale. Thursday for uh, set up the sale on Friday and Saturday. Next Sunday is Red Bird Mission Sunday. And we have been a supporter of Red Bird Mission for many, many years. And next Sunday is just a extra special day. Uh, the Christian Outreach Committee, their next meeting will be October 23rd. That's two weeks from now. And is there any other announcements? I have a couple. Um, it, is, it is that time of year. It's, it's scout popcorn season. And Mark Shearer, wait, Mark. <laughs> Mark Shearer will be in the lounge after church uh, selling scout popcorn. So please support our scouts and Mark. Uh, also, uh, on the way out, you will find not, on the same table where you will find your stewardship letter. Um, please pick those up because every, every one of those that you take home is one less that we have to buy a stamp for. Uh, so, but right next to those are copies of, of DLAP's uh, uh, eulogy and obituary if you were unable to be there on Friday. Okay. If you have any prayer concerns, please fill out a blue card that you find there in the pew, and the ushers will collect them during the first hymn. Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. After day, they pour forth speech, night after night. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord.
They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. This meditation of my heart, pleasing in your sight, O Lord. join in the opening prayer. Let us pray together. Oh God, we have come to hear your voice. Help us, we pray, to quiet our hearts and minds that we might be still and listen. Help us to open our hearts so that we might be willing to change for the better. May you be at work in us so that we could be more like you each day and become more like the people you created us to be. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children to come forward. We'll have a word with them. Now I'm worried about both of you. <laughs> I didn't remember if I showed this to you before or not. Do you know what this is? Oh, you can handle it. It's, it's made out of clay, so it is, you know, it does break, but it's okay, you can look at it. What do you think that is? What do you think it is? A turtle shell. A, what, a turtle shell? Well, no, it does kind of look like that. Keep, just pass it on so that you guys can see it. 
Any ideas? I think it might be a whistle. A whistle, that's a good guess. That's not it, but that's a good guess. Go ahead. A boat. A boat. Well, I suppose you could use it for a toy boat, but that's not it either. Go ahead. Um, a rubber ducky? Yeah, well, it's made out of clay, and no, it's not a duck. You want to see it? Here. Do you have any guesses what that is? No, no guesses. One, one more, one more guess. I think it's, um, looks like a bowling ball. Oh, uh, that's not, doesn't look anything like a bowling ball. A flat pin. A flat pin. Well, yeah, but wouldn't we very good as a bowling ball? What do you think? Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna mess with you because you don't have any idea. Guesses? Since you're the big kid, so I even got Mark. Mark stumped too. This is a flashlight. A flash? That it, could be a flashlight. It's not the kind of flashlight you know. It's a lamp. If you were, <laughs> if you were walking with Jesus at night two thousand years ago. This is it. This is what you got. There's, there's a scripture in the Bible from Psalm 119 said, Your word is a lamp, a lamp unto my, wait a, wait a minute, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This is a lamp. What you would, you would put oil in the, in the big hole and there would be a little wick, like, a, like one of the wicks on our candles that would stick out the little hole like that, and you would like the fire would be here. And we have, we have 2,000 and 3,000 year old lamps just like that in museums that still have the black on it from, from where the fire was. I had, a, I had a professor in my archeology, span I had a professor in my class pass about five of these around and we're passing them around looking at them and say, yeah, it is nice. And he said, oh yeah, by the way, those are 3,000 years old. And all of us like started holding them with two hands, you know. <clears throat> This now, one of the things, but one of the things I think is real important for the adults to hear, as well as the children, if this is a lamp, and you got a candle wick sticking out of the end of that, burning olive oil or something, when we read scripture that says, "Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path." Do you think that would put out so much light like a big flashlight with six batteries you could see about a mile down the road? No. You could see maybe your feet. You could see not you could see enough enough of the path in front of you not to trip over a big rock or fall off a cliff. But you're not going to see much you're not going to see much more than that. And so and so God's, God's promise when he says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, that means that God's going to help you. He's going to, you're, you're not going to step off a cliff or trip over a big rock, but God's not going to tell you what's going to happen next week. You think you can remember that? You can go sit down. I'm just going to jump For those of you who've never seen one of these, I'm gonna leave it where you all can come down and handle it. This, this is not a 2,000 year old one. This is a replica I bought when we were in Israel this, it, this May, but I'll leave it here and you all can, anybody wants to look at it can.
Thank you, choir. I got a pile. Some Sundays I don't have much of it all to, for prayer requests, and today is one of those, not one of those. Um, let's see. Don Kingen asked for prayers for his grandson, Nathan. Uh, Nathan is nine. He is scheduled for heart surgery in Columbus to correct a birth defect, but they had to wait until he was old enough to, to do the surgery. So they're doing surgery in Columbus. Uh, so prayers for Nathan. Uh, prayers for uh, Lucinda Fees' grandson, Dean. Uh, he is supposed to be in Air Force basic training. Well, he is at Air Force basic training. But during Air Force basic training, he has contracted COVID and strep throat. And so he is uh, in isolation because he's got COVID and strep throat until he gets better from that, at which point he's going to be far enough behind his basic training class that he's either going to have to start over or get cycled back to another company that's as far along as he was when he got sick. So that's not going to be great. <clears throat> um, so prayers, prayers for Dean. Um, did I mention New Philadelphia First UMC last week? I did not. I see blank faces. Um, please be in prayer for New Philadelphia First United Methodist Church. Um, we got an email that their pastor uh, has has been diagnosed with inoperable stomach cancer that's metastasized, and so he has immediately stepped down in the district's fine and somebody else filled pulpit. What's worse for that congregation, is like that, that wasn't bad enough, is this is the third pastor in a row that they have lost. They lost one to leukemia, I think, another to an auto accident, and now this one. Uh, uh, but I asked the district superintendent about him, and they said, and she said that she's talked to them, and despite it all, they are remarkably positive as a congregation. But still, uh, please, you can probably imagine what that might feel like to, to, as a congregation. So please, please be in prayer for New Philadelphia first. Um, <clears throat> also, continue to be in prayer for DLAP's family. Um, if you, if you have turned on the television or, or opened your newspaper, or made out and even made the papers, overnight there was um, an enormous uh, terrorist attack in southern uh, Israel. Uh, the, the Palestinians that are in the Gaza Strip, which is uh, not the main body of, uh, of the Palestinian uh, community, but, but a smaller one that's down on the, on the seaside, it, that one, that area of the Gaza Strip is controlled by the terrorist group Hamas and Hamas massed troops. And on a religious holiday on Shabbat, which is the day of worship for the Jews, uh, they poured troops across the border and they attacked uh, uh, Israeli communities and and hundreds upon hundreds of Is Israelis were killed. There's, there's video on television of they just drove down the street with, with tanks or whatever they drove, came in and, and, and destroyed automobiles of people who were trying to flee. And, and they kidnapped over 200 people as hostages. And uh, Israel has m m mobilized 80,000 troops that are on their way. Uh, is the nation of Israel has declared themselves to be at war and it's, it's gonna be bad. It's already bad. Uh, it's bad for Israel. It's bad for the Palestinians. As you can imagine, at this point, you know, part of the main issue that, that Israel and the Palestinians have is they don't trust each other. And so even though this is a little corner of Palestine, uh, of the Palestinian territories and not the main body of Palestinian territories, there's rumors that there's going to be more violence. And so there's more distrust. Um, and it's going to be bad for everybody. So please pray for, for all of all, everyone in Israel and in the Palestinian territories. It's not good for anybody. Um, also prayers for uh, this week are elections in, uh, in Liberia. And our Liberian friends have asked for prayer. Uh, Liberia is one of those countries where sometimes elections are violent. Um, and so they're asking for, for openness and uh, you know, open discussion and peace as they have their elections. Um, 
continue to pray for Bob and Carolyn Wallace uh, as Bob recovers from his, his open heart surgery. And, and Dan Gard is our person of the week. So you want to remember Dan and, and maybe call him or send him a message or text or email or send him a card or something. Let Dan know, um, even though he can't get here all that often, that he's still a part of who we are. He's still a part of our family and we care. So um, Dan, if you're watching, hi. Um, and, re and the rest of our list, which is long. Is there anybody else that I have neglected? I'm coming. <laughs> I have my reconstruction surgery tomorrow. Susan has surgery tomorrow. Like six million dollar man, we can rebuild him. Oh, yeah. but yeah, they're going to do that. <sighs> Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus. Some, t some days when we pray, we don't even know where to begin. We, we, we can list these things, and, and, and when we try and wrap our minds around them, we, we're, we're just broken. We are helpless and at a loss to even describe our feelings. And so we come to you and, and we, we lay our burdens at your feet because, because you created the world with a breath. You spoke words and, and, and things came into being that were not before. You put the moon and the stars in place. And so, so we come to you because we are powerless to do anything about any of these things but you are not. And so we cry out to you that you would be with Nathan, who's nine years old and facing uh, open heart surgery. We pray you'd be with Dean, who, who really wants to be in his Air Force basic training, and, and he's, he's stuck in isolation until he gets better. And then when he's done, he's going to have to go back then maybe start over. I don't know. But we pray that you'd be with Dean and encourage him and walk with him and pour out healing upon him. We pray that you'd be with the, the congregation of New Philadelphia First United Methodist Church and, and as, as they try to, to, to support their pastor. And we pray for him that, that you would pour out healing upon him and be with him and with his family and Walk with them as they go down this difficult path. We pray, we pray for the people of Israel and the, and the Palestinian territories. War is not good for any of them. Hundreds have already been hurt. Hundreds more have been kidnapped. Many more are going to be a part of the violence that follows we pray that somehow you would be a part. You are the prince of peace. And some, somehow we pray you would be a part of what's going on there to, to bring the two sides together to, 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 I don't know, help there to be less violence and more peace. We pray for the people of Liberia that the elections that they have this week would be peaceful, that you would be with Susan as she has surgery this week, tomorrow, in fact, that you would, you would pour out mercy and grace and healing and patience and comfort and all the things that Susan is going to need and, and, and Victor as well. We pray that you would be with them tomorrow, that they would feel your presence and your peace. We pray that you be with Dan, who is our person of the week that you would walk with him and, and help him to feel your presence and, and know that you are walking with him, but that he is a part of something bigger, that he belongs to our family, to your family. We pray you'd be with Bob and Carolyn. 
we give thanks for the healing that has happened already and that he is home recovering, but we pray that you would, you would continue to walk with them and pour out your, your healing upon Bob, that he would go, grow daily stronger and better so that they both can get back to doing the things that they love to do. And we pray for, for the family of D. Lapp as they discover each day what, what, what tomorrow is going to look like a new a new a new normal is going to emerge and we pray you would walk with them help them to feel your presence and and discover the closeness with you that d had we pray for everyone on our list we pray that you'd pour out mercy and grace and healing and hope and all the things that each of them need we pray you'd be with each one of us because, because even if we didn't raise our hand, we got stuff. We got situations at work. We have personality problems with neighbors and friends and family. We, we got stuff. Some of us are, have health problems we don't like to talk about and we're exhausted all the time. And, and whatever it is, we lift it up to you and pray that you would walk with us and pour out healing upon us and draw us closer to you. Help us each day to be a little bit better than the day before, a little more like Jesus than the day before. We give thanks, O Lord, for all your gifts, for your son Jesus, and for this prayer that he taught to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we'd like to ask our ushers to uh, prepare themselves and collect our morning offering. give thanks, O oh Lord, for all your gifts. You've blessed us with life and health and family and homes and 
and peace. We see, we see war in the Ukraine, and we see war in Israel now, and, and people who really just want to be out of the way, caught in the middle. And we are grateful to be where we are, and we give thanks. We, we brought gifts because we want to show you that our thankfulness for all that you have given to us. We pray that you would continue to walk this journey of life with us. And all God's people said, I should mention before I begin that there are extra flowers in front today. Uh, the D, D. Lapp's family wanted us to have them and, en and enjoy them, so, so they're there. I'm not sure what should happen to them after Sunday worship, so if somebody really wants some, I suppose that'd be okay. <clears throat> or if some of you who go out who are returning home to Copeland know somebody who would like to enjoy them, please do that. Ah. Uh, in 1985, which seems like an eternity ago for, for like Mark and some of the, the, our teens, but, um, but, but not that long ago for others of us, in 1985, radio stations everywhere were playing the debut of Robert Palmer's new hit song, Addicted to Love. That song will be familiar to many of us in a particular age group, but begins like this. The lights are on, but you're not home. Your mind is not your own. Your heart sweats, your body shakes. Another kiss is what it takes. You can't sleep, you can't eat. There's no doubt you're in deep. Your throat is tight, you can't breathe. Another kiss is all you need. Whoa, you like to think you're immune to this stuff, oh yeah. It's closer to the truth to say you can't get enough. You know you're gonna have to face it. You're addicted to love. Robert Palmer may have taken a certain amount of artistic license. But just this week, I had a conversation with a friend about how some people just can't stand to live alone. And that can lead to them making bad choices and being in a relationship with someone that isn't good for them and sometimes just one bad relationship after another because they can't stand to be alone. Addiction of any kind, even an addiction to something that is normally good, can be a bad thing. Addiction, even to something good, takes things too far and winds up being harmful rather than good. That's one of the things that we find as we read and think about today's scriptures. We begin with what God intended for good, the Ten Commandments. Most of these commandments are regarded as good things, even by people who do not share our faith, and even by people who have no faith at all. Prohibitions against theft, murder, adultery, and false witness, just to name a few, are almost inarguably good things. But can such prohibitions go too far? Before we get into that, let's just begin at the beginning and, and read the words of Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving to you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. 
You shall not give false, wit false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and the lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has not come to test you. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and in order to keep you from sinning. Do you get that? Isn't that kind of a, a twist there? God has come to test you so that the fear of God will the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Saying things like, "Don't take things that don't belong to you." And, and and don't murder other people, don't hurt other people, or, or, or even saying things like, it's not good to even wish you had the nice things your neighbor has. So saying those kind of things are really not controversial. Even, even honoring your parents when they deserve it is, is something that most of us can generally agree upon. But we can understand why people who do not share our faith or who don't believe in God at all would take issue with the rules about, about gods and idols and taking God's name in vain or, or even keeping the Sabbath. But other than those rules that are specific to our worship of our God, I think most people would agree that these are reasonable rules. And in fact, most of these rules end up being codified in the laws of cities and states and nations around the world. But that's where the trouble starts, isn't it? Per or perhaps if we think about it in another way, that's, that's where the addiction starts. In an attempt to ensure that the people of Israel would always follow these 10 rules, the leaders of Israel, wrote more rules that regulated life or, or in a sense put fences around the rules so that people wouldn't even accidentally break the Ten Commandments. But even that wasn't enough for some people. You see, after Israel had been carried into captivity in Babylon for 70 years and, and then they returned to Israel and rebuilt their nation, the leaders began to understand, finally, that their exile had been caused by, their diso by Israel's disobedience to God. And so at some point, the people that we know as the Pharisees in the time of the New Testament accumulated an even longer list of rules that, that built fences around the fences that were built around the Ten Commandments and while some of the Pharisees were legitimately trying to keep Israel on the straight and narrow and stay close to God, others began to become more devoted to the rules than they were to the God they were supposed to worship. It was exactly that sort of thing that the Pharisees uh, uh, were up in arms about in regard to the popularity that Jesus had with common people. The background to that, that, that upsetness, that's a terrible word, isn't it? Um, that feeling of being upset, that, that, that the reason they were up in arms is a part of why we hear exchanges like the one we're about to read in Matthew chapter 21, which, which incidentally, I want to point out, immediately follows the passage we read last week in which Jesus said that prostitutes and tax collectors were getting into heaven before the Pharisees. Okay, so, so it's not like they weren't already insulted enough when Jesus said tax collectors and Pharisees are going to go into heaven before you guys. Then 
Jesus says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and he put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. And then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and he moved to another place. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. So his, his percentage, all right? The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, stoned a third. And then he sent other servants to them more than the first time. And the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my, my son. He said, but when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. And so they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they said. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew that he was talking about them. Well, duh. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that Jesus was a prophet. One of the first things we should probably notice is that Jesus may very well be foretelling his own death in this parable, since it isn't hard to understand that as the Son of God, he is the son of the landowner of Israel. The second thing to notice is that even though the priests and the Pharisees may not have understood Jesus' allusion to being the son of the landowner, they clearly understood that he was talking about them, that they were the ungrateful tenants of the story. Everyone understood, everyone, the Pharisees, the priests, and all the common people who were gathered around, everyone understood that Jesus was accusing Israel's leadership of not giving to God what was expected and due. The accusation is clear that the leaders of Israel had violated several of God's commandments. They had put themselves ahead of God they had made money and power and influence and the rules into an idol and that they were generally unfaithful to God. The contrast to the priests and the Pharisees that, that, uh, that we read about in that story is found in the life of Paul, who was also a Pharisee, but whom, after his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, lived a transformed life as a Pharisee. After Paul's conversion, he sees the rules and his former addiction to the rules in an entirely different light. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul says, if someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, I persecuted the church. As for righteousness based on the law, I am faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss 
for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them to be garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul was a Pharisee. Even after he came to follow Jesus Christ, he still referred to himself as a Pharisee. He still followed the rules that many of the Pharisees uh, have. He followed the rules that's what he was saying. He was born into the right kind of a family. He went to the right kind of schools. He had the right kind of teachers. He and his family followed all of the prescribed rituals. He dedicated his life to enforcing the rules. He hunted down Jews who had chosen to follow Jesus and prosecuted them and imprisoned them for their failure to follow the rules. He was there watching the coats of the men who stoned Stephen in Jerusalem. And, and I think we can safely say that Paul was addicted to the rules. But after he met Jesus, his addiction was broken. And he saw the rules in an entirely different light. I don't want you to misunderstand. Paul still followed most of those rules. He still thought that they were an important part of his faith. But the rules were no longer an addiction. They were no longer something that was more important to him than faith. His addiction and the value that he once put on rules and money and power and influence, he now valued no more than garbage. In fact, the word that translates into English in this passage that translates as garbage is the name of the valley below Jerusalem where the sewers emptied where dead animals were thrown, where the remains of the sacrifices from the temple were burned. It was a place of disgusting filth. And that, Paul says, was the value that he now placed on his former addiction. Addiction of any kind. Even an addiction to something that is normally good takes things too far and winds up being harmful. And, and that's true whether you're addicted to love, rules, tradition, sex, money, power, politics, authority, fame, fortune, comfort, prestige, sports, hobbies, family, or anything else that you might possibly put ahead of God. God said, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Even if those gods seem like a good thing, we cannot put them ahead of God. It's important that we get that right. 
Let us sing together, guide my feet, Lord. Don't forget, there's a bunch of stuff in the lounge to do on the way out. You have some stewardship letters to pick up, and if you want a copy of, of uh, Dee's eulogy, an obituary, that's out there. Uh, sign up for uh, a spot if you haven't already for get your pictures taken uh, for the directory. Um, if you want to take a look at that lamp, it's down here on the stool. You're welcome to look at that as well. This is, this is a, this addiction thing is a challenging thing for us. It's, a, it's easy for us to, to look at folks who, who have gone the wrong way with drugs and alcohol and a few other things and, and point to them and say, I'm not like that. I wouldn't be so sure because sometimes it's really easy for us to get addicted to our own thing, to, to, to find our own, our own, you know, we may not have uh, a, a picture of the, the god Neptune in a, in a little niche in our house, you know, or, or Baal or any of those little gods that had figures and figures. We may not have that kind of idol, but there are other things that can become the focus of our lives that we become so dedicated to, even if they were once good things, they begin to move us away from God and we put God in second place. And that's not good. Let us be on the lookout for anything that would take God's place, even if it, like rules, are generally a good thing. Have a great week, everybody.